Uh, our next guest is someone you will know um, of great rapport, uh, lively and energetic. He's going to kick us uh, actively into uh, action, I have no doubts. And in fact, if I say guest number two, you'll probably have an idea of who it is. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's known for moving around in fast cars, uh, big trucks. And he manages to explain the difficult to explain rather well. Um, his name is George Gammon, previous star on our show, very, very popular. And uh, he's gone about properly breaking down how this whole system and Ponzi has been running. Um, and he will have seen an immense amount that's gone down in this year that I think he'd like to uh, carry with him as wisdoms. And I'm sure he's pretty much on the other side of uh, here uh, waiting to come on. So, George, let me know. Are you out there? Yeah. Oh, great. There he is. Great. Great to have you. George, looks like uh, much the same uh, last time we, uh, we spoke. Are you Arizona stateside? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just in Phoenix for a couple months here. Excellent. Welcome. Well, first of all, uh, what a year we've had. We are putting it to bed, the burying of 2020. <laughs> I don't know how you feel uh, about it. Um, if I give you an opportunity, just before I suppose I should uh, give you an opportunity to introduce yourself as best uh, as you can. And also, uh, we're going to open a virtual bubbly with you. Uh, I'm afraid you won't be able to have some of the champagne, but I'm hoping that there's some nearby. Uh, but uh, thank you for being an awesome guest last time. We're looking forward to hearing what you hear and wishing you all the best for Christmas and the new year. We've been a bit frivolous. We're trying to look at the bright side of life. I don't, if you remember the Monty Python skit uh, as we head into 2021. Um, so while many supposedly pretty negative things uh, have happened, we are burying 2020. We've also gained a bunch of knowledge. Um, what's your big takeouts? Uh, for 2020, what have you most learned about the financial system and what knowledge would you suggest we start by applying strongest going into 2021? Well, I think you're seeing in real time the extent to which governments are willing to extend their power. And um, I think that's all, on one side, obviously, it's frightening. On the other side, at least they're showing their cards. And you can say, okay, well, here's the line in the sand. I would argue there probably is no line, <laughs> but that in and of itself is knowledge. Yes. And that knowledge is power. So if you now know that there really is no line that they are unwilling to cross, you can start setting up your life in a way that uh, hopefully will be, will have the highest probability of maintaining your personal freedom and liberty. So I think that's, I mean, you could say, well, that's a bad thing. It's, um, on the other hand, I, I think it's a, a good thing. It gives yeah. you the, that knowledge and power that we were referring to. Um, as far as, uh, I mean, just broad strokes with the markets, I think it's very apparent that we're getting MMT. You had Janet Yellen come in as the, the treasury secretary and uh, the first step to MMT is just combining the balance sheets of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. So if I was going to do that, um, who would I hire as the Treasury Secretary? Just someone who was maybe the last Fed chair. <laughs> it's a pretty good idea of how both balance sheets work. <laughs> so I e Even the actors I are being combined, aren't they? The, the same actors are coming into scene. Yeah, I, I think I tweeted out the other day, I was just kind of joking that uh, now they're going to hire Stephanie Kelton uh, <laughs> you know, after Jerome Powell leaves, and that would just be the icing on the cake. But I think they're going in that direction anyway. And I, I, I don't know that that's really a, a tinfoil hat-ish type of view. I, I just spoke with Danielle DiMartino Booth uh, yesterday, and or excuse me, Friday, and she has the exact same opinion that uh, that could potentially be why they're bringing in Janet Yellen. But even if it isn't, that's going to be the direction they're headed now. And so that just means the Federal Reserve taking bank reserves, which is really the only thing they can print right now, and turning them into legal tender by spending them directly into the economy without going through the, uh, the banking system, the commercial banking system. 
And now they're kind of getting around that through the government spending it, the Fed monetizing it. But um, they might even just kind of cut out the charade. I think that's another thing in 2020 that we learned is that we, we've really become a, a nation of men and not of law. Because you look at what we did with the Federal Reserve Act, meaning we completely ignored it in uh, March of 2020. And I don't think that if even pundits on CNBC, I don't think they would even argue yeah. that uh, the Fed stayed within the confines of the Federal Reserve Act back in March. I think everyone would admit that, yeah, they, they ignored it, they got around it, and the special purpose vehicle set up just to buy junk debt, that's just a smoke and mirrors. And But no one called them out on it. And they're like, well, yeah, they, you know, it wasn't part of the Federal Reserve Act, but they had to do it. They had to do it. And I think, again, this, this shows us that the economy and also shows us that they know this, they realize this. The economy is built on asset bubbles, debt and confidence. Yeah. And they realize if they don't prop up the asset bubbles in particular, <clears throat> that the economy will collapse. It'll crash down on itself and on itself like a house of cards. So we see that what they're willing to do, which is pretty much everything, you know, QE, Infinity, and all these four or five letter programs and taking the Fed's balance sheet up over, uh, I think it's 7.3 trillion. I was just listening yes. to my good buddy, Peter Schiff the other day, and he was saying that just last week, the Fed's balance sheet went up by over like 120 billion in just the one week. One and week. he was saying that he thinks the Fed's balance sheet could go to 10 billion, or excuse me, 10 trillion by the end of 2021. And I think we could get there earlier than that, just mm -hmm. depending if we have uh, on whether or not we have another crisis. I think that as long as the stock market is kind of elevated, the central planners at the Fed or the government are less incentivized to go in and just throw everything up against the wall to see what sticks, taking the Fed's balance sheet, that 10 trillion. But if we get the market coming down violently, like it did in March, I call it 20, 30 percent. That's when you're going to see the, the balance sheet go from seven to 10 trillion very, very quickly, in my opinion. So we the, the Fed and the government, I think, really showed us their cards with uh, what they did back in March. And I think, again, that that's a good thing. If you're a long term investor, yeah. it shows you that they're more than willing to trash the dollar. Uh, that, you know, I don't know that, uh, you know, I'm very sympathetic to my good buddies, Jeff Snyder and, and Brent Johnson, who are more in the dollar bull camp. And I don't think by any stretch it's uh, impossible for the dollar to go back up to call it 110 or 120. But um, I, I don't know that the central planners are sophisticated enough to even understand Brent and uh, Jeff's argument. <laughs> I think that they're just, uh, you know, trying to get the dollar weaker to kind of offload some of the burden of the, the, the debt that the government has assumed in 2020. Uh, most people don't realize it, but they'll probably tack on about $5 trillion in debt, which is the same amount of debt the whole entire country accumulated from 1776 to 1996, so 220 years, that's a lot of debt. But my point is I think they'll, they've shown their cards that they're willing to just try to create as many currency units. And even if under the current system, that's difficult for them to do, therefore the debt would be deflationary. I think in this new system of Janet Yellen coming in, combining the balance sheets and them spending bank reserves as though they were actual dollars and legal tender. That's the next step. And we know, and, and even Jeff and Brent, I think, would admit that if they start doing that, they're going to reevaluate their uh, deflationary and dollar bullish stance. So once they kind of cross that Rubicon, which I think they will, uh, we know that they have no problem whatsoever printing as much money, and that would be literal money printing, uh, enough to take the dollar down you know, to 70, maybe 60, maybe even 50. Wow. So the, the great thing is we know that. So then we can position ourselves accordingly, but then also go through the thought experiment, which is what I've been doing this weekend. 
on figuring out, okay, so the dollar right now is called 90, uh, dip down 89 handle. So if it goes back down to 70, a lot of people think, oh my gosh, that would be catastrophic. But you got to remember that just going back to I believe it was 2011, we were down at 70 on the DXY. So it, it, I don't think it's a matter of uh, the catastrophe being if it goes back down to 70, but maybe more so how fast it goes to 70 and how you know violent the, the move is. But uh, then you think, okay, well, you know, 50, 60, you know, what does that world look like? What does that do to U.S. exports? What does that do to imports? I think a lot of people that want to uh, put on their rose-colored glasses would say that, oh, well, that's great news because then the U.S. exports will be far more competitive and we need to manufacture more things here anyway. But <laughs> you don't realize that uh, we've been running massive trade deficits for a long, long time, meaning that we import a lot more than we export. So the I think the impact of the prices that at Walmart and Target and Home Depot, all those things that we import going up significantly would more than outweigh the benefit of maybe some, some manufacturing. And then also that assumes that the regulation or the regulatory environment in the United States is conducive to creating more manufacturing. And I would argue that it's going the complete opposite direction. You know, so many people, so many economists, they look at just the, the currency going up or down and say, oh, that's gonna be good for manufacturing or bad. But they and they never seem to consider the regulatory environment. And I think yeah. I've got a little bit of an edge there because I was an entrepreneur my entire life. And I, I didn't know the first thing about macro or economics. I didn't know what a yield curve was. I didn't know what the Fed was. But I knew how to start a business. And I knew what the differences in starting a business in a place like California, which I did, and how much... Uh, different that was in starting a business in, let's say, Arizona from a standpoint of yeah. regulation. Yeah. And I know how difficult it is to operate a business. And my, keep in mind, this was all the way back in maybe 2004, 2005 was the last time I operated a business in California. So I, I can't even fathom uh, what it's like now and how restrictive it is. But I, I think that a lot of the macro thinkers Obviously, these guys and gals are incredibly intelligent, far more intelligent than I'll ever be. But they they don't really ever consider the regulatory environment for their inflation deflation type of projections. And I think that 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 could be a mistake. So my point is, from a regulatory standpoint, I don't think manufacturing will will ever come back uh, to the United States in a significant no. manner because who wants to take that billion dollars? worth of capital and and put it to work in um, in a, a jurisdiction that most likely is going to be very unfriendly to uh, business in the next five, 10 years. That's so I think, again, it's 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 not it's I, I don't want to be too doom and gloom. It, no. There's a lot of things that are, are frightening from an economic standpoint, personal liberty. But I think it, the good news is we're, we're seeing what they're willing to do, and therefore we can be more prepared. We won't be blindsided by it in 2021 or 22. Yeah. I love your opening statement, by the way. That's a great opening statement. We covered actually a lot in that. One of the things I most like is that um, we've got great guests, many of them you know. You've just mentioned some of them uh, coming on after you. But of all of them, I'd say you're, you probably represent – where you, you recognize that there's a greater game going on a little bit more, uh, you, or you're more prepared to speak about it. I respect that some things, some people don't want to go there, but I do feel it's kind of like we've been in a campfire in the forest somewhere, and you know there's a handful of people that are uh, camping, and we're all sitting around the fire, and half the people say there's something moving in the bush there. And the others are yeah. all saying, no, 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 you're a conspiracy. You're just a nervous camper. You're just joining dots that aren't there to be joined. And actually, it's like the wolf broke cover, literally. That's the key point in, I would take out, and yeah. you said it was almost the first thing you said. There is no doubt in my mind that there is serious behind-the-scenes orchestrating of a great global reset. We took the great reset as our brand 
about six, seven years ago, and they've taken it off us. I don't even want to touch the phrase anymore. The World Economic Forum, uh, all sorts of people are literally prophesizing things that they're probably actively involved in bringing about. Um, if you take all the history behind them and all the people involved. But as you say, it's not good news. It means it, th there is a new war and it's a war against the citizen by the overarching governments and the people behind them. It's now a case of at least we know it's going on. If you're, if you're reasonably awake and they've broken cover, there's a wolf in the bush and you've seen it. Uh, it's now yeah. a question of how do you sleep tonight? What kind of preparation do you do uh, and how do you prepare? And I suppose one of the core thrusts of uh, where we hope to add value for people, and you do very much the same. And by the way, people should absolutely be following. We've got 573 guys here, live stream going on. You should go grab right now, George Gammon, if you're not already following uh, channel for the amazing whiteboard um, uh illustrations that he does that breaks everything down in great detail and he tackles topics quite boldly um, where some prefer not to tread but that point uh, aside building wealth in an environment where it looks like the table of the casino is being tipped and all the chips go to those that are leveraged long and have the means to be leveraged long in the various right. hyper inflating asset classes uh, and the rest of the people are breadline or working businesses and having their small businesses crushed whilst big mega corp uh, online businesses are absolutely uh, flourishing almost. So we have this polarization. My 2017 YouTube said there are events coming and all I know is there's going to be a major polarizing event. You will either be part of the pleb plebeian class or you will make the cut in having sufficient income to buy off your way of draconian and very authoritarian future government. And it, that's that's the only way to see it. And if it's if it's not pleasant to hear, it's still a truth. We shouldn't be stopped from being able to say it. But at least now we probably have a higher degree of conviction that the wolf has broken cover, and that's exactly what it is. So if we take that piece of information, there's a question coming for you out of all of that preamble: is it, doesn't that make all asset classes which are not debt and fiat itself the big long? In other words, in spite of stinky stocks being as hypervaluated, they probably will go higher. Um, Bitcoin and gold and silver are like uh, almost, uh, you know, must-haves for the long. Doesn't that mean it's the leveraged long trade season um, for most tangible assets that are finite of any form? We're seeing copper, uranium is stirring up. Uh, I'm, we've seen coffee, so we're going to have soft agri uh, bulls. You can choose your market in tangibles. Yeah. Is this not the season of the great long? What's your take? I think it is, but you got to be careful. And uh, you have, have to study the, the great investors. And I would suggest that everyone, before they figure out how much gold, silver, Bitcoin commodities they want to have in their portfolio, they read the market wizards books by Jack Schweiger. Yes. Because then you're going to understand that the, the pros and the guys and the gals who win at this game long term and the people who have an edge aren't necessarily the people and well, are not the people who get hyper focused and, and allocate 99% of their mental bandwidth to what to buy or sell. That's, that's not how you play the game. The way you play the game is you have to allocate 90% of your mental bandwidth to portfolio construction. Gotcha. And you have to allocate another 5% to understanding your own personality and your, uh, your own emotions. Yeah. And then maybe 5% to picking, okay, do I like Bitcoin? Do I like gold? Do I like uranium? Do I like all these other things? It's it's most people I think would be uh, far better off if they if they allocated an opposite amount of time and energy to to actually what they're doing. So now having said, and now the reason I say that is because so many people and the, the gold bugs have been uh, just as guilty of this in the past and the silver bugs where they say, well. I think that there's a 
hundred percent chance mm. that gold, Bitcoin, silver, fill in the blank is going to the moon. And therefore I'm going to take every credit card I have and max it out and, and buy, uh, you know, fill in the blank yeah. Bitcoin or gold. And I see so many people doing that in the comments of my videos and on Twitter. And uh, it's for me, I always want to go out there and take the other side of the of the argument, whether it's in uh, gold or Bitcoin, yeah. just so people realize that, that hey, there's not 100 percent certainty of anything going up, that we, we are imperfect yeah. creatures living in an imperfect world. And you and, and if you think there's more than, let's say, a 60 percent, maybe 70 percent chance of something going to the moon, uh, then you're, you're not understanding all the variables. You don't know what you don't know. Trust me on that one. Yeah. And, um, and it's 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 ironically, it's usually the very unsophisticated uh, investors or uh, traders, because I don't think they've been burned in the past. To have that that knowledge scar yeah. that the guy is like a, a Jim Rogers or a Stan Druckenmiller yeah. would say, no, 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 that this is, uh, you know, I don't care how bullish I am on X, Y, Z. It's not going to be more than, let's say, 10 percent of my portfolio. So that's kind of the, the the warning label that I would give prior to my answer. Now, that said, I do agree that uh, everyone, it would behoove them to own gold, uh, own silver, own Bitcoin. I would own them for different reasons, though. So for me, I always say I like to set up my portfolio in this 10, 80, 10. So 10 percent allocated to physical gold. That's just the insurance. And then you've got that other 10 percent that would be allocated towards speculations. And I define that by uh, things that would just seem to have a lot of asymmetry. So going back to March, uh, I bought a lot of uranium because right. I saw it as a really good speculation. Bitcoin, same thing. Great asymmetry, great speculation. The gold miners, the silver, th those are things that, that don't necessarily pay me to own them. But I, I think the upside versus downside is very attractive. Then with the bulk of the portfolio, 80%, I allocate that to investments. And I define that as things that actually pay me to own them. So right now, or back in March and April when I was buying the most, that would be uh, dividend producing, uh, well, dividend paying producers for these yeah. commodities, such as coal, such as oil, such as, uh, you know, copper and things like that. If you get one with gold, that'd be fantastic. But uh, you, you, so these things are, are, are paying you to own them. Rental properties would be a good example. Maybe there's some bonds. I would not uh, touch the bond market in the developed world with a 10 foot pole, but maybe they're, they're bonds. Uh, you know, last time I spoke with Jim Rogers, he was thinking about buying um, ruble denominated bonds. And so, you know, that is an example of something that would pay you to own it. So you can yeah. pay to wait until the investment thesis pays off. But even if it doesn't, you, you're still ahead on the bet, right? So like, that's one reason why I went into real estate so heavily in 2012 was I knew that I, I didn't know what I didn't know <laughs> going back to that. And, but if I could buy, XYZ property, and let's say I have $75,000 cash in. So I buy that. And these were actually, believe it or not, real numbers back then in the Midwest in good neighborhoods. Yeah. You could buy a house from a bank. They're just giving them away, call it $50,000, $55,000. You put 25 or 30 into it. So let's say you're in it, uh, you know, 75000 out of pocket. And the thing would rent out all day long for $1,000 a month. Yeah. So that math works all day. Yeah. So my point is that's an example of an investment that doesn't need to do anything mm. in order to work. Yeah. All it has to do is do what it, exactly what it's doing on day one, where you contrast that to like uranium when I bought it back in March, where it, it's got to go up in price. There's got to be more buyers than sellers yes. in order for that to pan out, right? Uh, a rental property isn't that way, or potentially a dividend paying stock. 
you know, in the commodity space. It's not that way. And I work a lot with uh, Lynn Alden and Chris McIntosh, yeah. and they're, you know, the pros. I'm an amateur, but we talk about uh, stocks overseas that are paying fantastic dividends that are going to benefit from a stagflationary environment. And you could just sit back, hold them, and you get paid to wait. So that, again, that goes back to that portfolio construction. Right? And I like to be far more cognizant of that and, and allocate more mental bandwidth to that than just trying to figure out what's going up or down. Yeah, I like, I like a lot of that. There's also in terms of what we're discussing is given the extent that these things may move, there's also an inherent volatility that goes hand in hand with that, that makes for a very bumpy ride. Um, and especially if anybody has not earned the right to leverage and decides to bring it to bear, um, you can actually lose going long in a very strong long market just because some of the harshest, most vicious dips can actually occur. Uh, in an upward climbing market uh, as well. Yeah, it gets, it gets super choppy. In fact, you know, on that note, I was listening to my good buddy, Luke Groman the other day, and he was talking about gold during the hyperinflation of Weimar Germany and denominated in their local currency. Yeah. And you would think that if you would have bought gold, that you would have just made an absolute fortune. But he said, if you would have, if you look at the, the, the yearly charts, that's true. Mm. But he says what people, the mistake they make is they don't look at the monthly and weekly charts. Yeah. He says, if you look at the monthly and weeklies, you see that the price of gold was so volatile. Yeah. Up, down, up, down, up, down, all over the place that yes, over the span of a year, the price went up and up and up because of the hyperinflation. Yeah. But especially during the, those first few years of hyperinflation yeah. where it's, you know, where it's uh, it's losing, let's say, 50 percent per month or something yeah. like that. As far as the, the currency, he said, if you would have purchased gold on leverage back then, you would have been wiped out yeah. like two or three times per year yeah. during hyperinflation where the, the currency is just absolutely crashing just because of the volatility. And that's a great point. And that's something that most people don't realize. You yeah. know, I was listening to the um, original Market Wizards books actually this morning and um, just reminding myself, I like to do that all the time, just remind myself of the real fundamentals and how the pros operate and remind myself that it's not just about thinking you're right or wrong, but it's actually defining what your mathematic edge is what is your edge? And if you can't define exactly what your edge is relative to everyone else, then you don't have an edge. Yeah. And if you keep doing what you're doing, the way you're doing it over the long run, you're going to lose money yeah. because you're betting against the house. Right. But anyway, my, my point, point is uh, there was one of these professionals that Jack Schweiger was uh, talking to. And the guy was talking about one of these trades that he did early in his career where he went long soybeans on, on, you know, using a bunch of leverage and he kept like four or five days in a row. It, it the market opened like limit down to where he could not get out of the trade yeah. and he was losing like 10% of his net worth daily. And he was talking to, and mind you, this is a guy that had been doing this. He was a pro at the time. Now he was a younger guy, younger than he was at the time of the interview. But, um, you know, let's say he'd been doing it for four or five years up to this point. And he, he walked through the emotional roller coaster uh, of <laughs> losing that 10 percent per day. And I mean, he was almost suicidal, like like he was crying. He was he, he was thinking that all these people out on the street were intentionally trying to or, or taking uh, getting satisfaction out of the, the out, out of him uh, going broke and yeah. becoming you know, closer and closer to having to get a real job every single day. He was having these nightmares. Yeah. I, I mean, so think about that. Th this is a pro. This, uh, you know, they've been doing this for five years. People just don't understand the emotional impact of not only when the, it, the bet goes against you, but also when it goes up. Yeah. 
you know so what do you do what do you do if gold goes to ten thousand? yeah it's emotional like, like most people are just like "Ooh, i'd be celebrating no you wouldn't you you'd be you'd be even under more stress yeah because you'd be because it's so much of your portfolio and it's so meaningful it's so significant that now you're sweating bullets. You probably can't even sleep because yeah. you don't know whether you should sell, whether you should buy. Yeah. You're just, you've got this internal debate and dialogue going on in your head just constantly. You can't eat, you can't sleep. That's what most people don't realize. Yeah, it's very intense and you pay for your profits in emotional stress. And as you say, if, if right, gold does right, go to 10K, right I mean, it just has to dip $500 and you think, damn, that's it. It's crashing. And then you get high, hyper emotive and you, and you jump out and then it goes up 1,250 and you go, damn, I knew it would make a new high, chase back in. Um, and I've got to make up for that, which I've just lost. So you jump in leveraged and then it's a you're marginally higher high and then it has a real 25% crash. It's, it's super emotional. In the absence of method, you're going to get killed uh, and not yep. respecting leverage. Uh, I think Peter Brunt has said it a few times. Uh, I don't agree with everything technically he says, but his rights, anyone who's been around for long enough, um, you, the money management is the game. Uh, then you can talk about approaches and technical entries and stops and targets. And I warn the guys with Bitcoin with the, the, as much as we expect these ridiculous potential numbers with this institutional money, um, the first part, I think, will be relative dips, relatively small. Once we threw 25,700, I think we, we could have some beautiful 25% corrections uh, potentially. You know, when you're at 60,000, boom, you can drop 15K and be at 45 again. And then you can go b racing to 90. Uh, and that's, as you've said, the micro detail of those gold charts in Weimar. I mean, there was a limited availability of good information during such a traumatic period. And in some senses, history prepares you for the future. I'm starting to think there's going to be such turmoil. In, it's quite clear they're going to be doing a reset. There's going to be dramas. You've got Klaus talking about uh, electrical uh, grids going down. That's why you have gold oh, yeah. and silver, uh, not just Bitcoin. You just spoke about portfolio theory. Um, guys, uh, we love Rao, but he's talking irresponsibly long. And, I, and I've mentioned people, Rao's position isn't necessarily yours. Uh, you know, he's, he would worked at Goldman Sachs. He's got a big investment portfolio. And he probably still has other stuff, like the home he lives in and many other things. So guys have got to uh, have a stable, not a single racehorse, potentially, uh, and watch the leverage. Uh, because the volatility and... And the, the, going back to your Weimar Republic example, I imagine people didn't know what was going on. You know, government decree, there's such panic in government and the communication, they're busy deciding what do we tell the public. Often they deem it's not in the best interests to fully disclose, so they mislead, right. they jawbone, and this then leads to people reacting in the day. Maybe this is the end of this, it can't get any worse, you know, and then boom, we're printing another 10 trillion. Shoot. Uh, then it's collapsed. No, we won't be doing it. So it must be very, very confusing. Uh, and I think we're going to have that level of confusing. I mean, we've just had an election where you can talk to two different colors and you get two completely different stories about the same event. Uh, and uh, one, one are convinced that there was fraud uh, and all sorts of it. And the others probably think it was negligible or not at all. Uh, and that you're just trying to disenfranchise them. And it just shows how you can get two totally different perspectives. Um, and I'm sure you will have your opinion and I have mine too. But uh, we're going to have a lot of that, I think, with the unfurling. It's going to be chaos. It's almost like yeah. it needs to be chaos. It falls into that problem reaction solution. For something to be truly a problem, you need chaos. You need fear. It's all emotions that are, are, are related to confusion lack of good quality, reliable information. And that's what makes right. markets gyrate. Well, that's right. But you see what they've done and tried to do is take out that volatility in the market. Mm. And I think Chris Cole just nails it when he says you cannot destroy volatility. No, you can only you can only shift it. Suspend it only, for a while. You can only go from the markets to society. Yeah. And I think that, that going back to the first part of our conversation, when we were talking about the, the economy being built on asset prices, debt and confidence, 
in, in asset bubbles being the main component there, the more they, the central planners, try to prop up those markets and, and eliminate volatility, the more volatility you're going to have in society at large. And I think looking into 2021 and 2022, that's what we really need to prepare for. Because, you know, I was reading a statistic the other day and it just, I mean, I, I almost fell out of my chair. The statistic was the number or the percentage of adults age 18 to 29 yeah. who still live at home with their parents. This was in the United States. And I, you know, prior to me seeing the actual statistic, if you would have asked me, I would have said, well, it's got to be high. So I guess maybe 5% or <laughs> maybe 10%. Because I just remember back when I was uh, 17, 18. And I mean, it just, this wasn't just with me. No. This was everyone in yeah. my entire high school. You're gone. Yeah. Like you're, you're gone. We don't care how bad the economy is. We don't yeah. care... If you're going to be homeless, we don't care if you can afford rent. We don't care <laughs> if you can afford food. You're gone. And it's time for you to be an adult. And that was just the way the cookie crumbled back then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so anyway, you know, that's why I'm thinking 5 uh, 10%. The real percentage is 52%. Wow. 5-2% yeah, of adults 18 to 29 still live at home with their parents. So you think about, okay, that group of people most likely doesn't own assets. And yeah. it's all the, the, the baby boomers and the people who have a, just inadvertently listened to Dave Ramsey. Therefore, they have a, a 401k. They're the ones that have benefited from all of the central bank and government shenanigans. And it's only going to get worse. You know, an anecdotal story that I'll tell you just being right here in Phoenix is I the, the building I'm in is uh, right in the same area where I used to live back in 2000, call it uh, 7 to 2010. Basically, yeah. they're sister buildings. And so in, it's in an area called the Biltmore in Phoenix, 24th Street in Camelback. When I lived here back 2007 to 2010, there, there was zero homeless people. I mean, the Biltmore is, is one of the nicest areas nicest, in yeah. all of Phoenix. In order to find someone homeless, you would have had to go down the, the street, probably uh, maybe call it five, six main streets before you started to get in some rough areas there where you might see a homeless person. Yeah. Now, there are homeless people everywhere, e everywhere, walking down the sidewalks with the, the shopping carts on the corners, begging for food outside of Whole Foods, Trader Joe's. You know, uh, it's, uh, oddly, it's always these kind of yuppie rich person places where all the... You see a lot of the homeless, ironically. But yeah. my point is going down to Old Town Scottsdale. That, yeah, I know so, Scottsdale. Let's go, back, yeah. let's go back to 2008. I used to have, I, I'm a big car guy. So yeah. back in 2008, I had a, what they call a Lamborghini Gallardo. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Me too. back then, I mean, I would take that car down to Scottsdale. Yeah. And, and, and people would be like, wow, holy cow. Wow, that's a neat car. You know, people would take pictures of it and stuff like that. Now, if you go down to uh, Scottsdale in a McLaren or a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, something like that, I've wanted 100 people. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. You go yeah. to the mall and it, it's like, yeah, so what? You've got a you know, 458 Italia. Who cares? Yeah. You know, that's, that's last year's model. Yeah. Like, so my point is you see this massive divergence where you have this small group of people in Scottsdale, let's say, that are you know hanging out in in the rich areas, they're they've got ten times more Ferraris, Bentleys, Lamborghinis, Aston Martins, and yet when you look at the ninety nine percent, the the homeless population has increased tenfold as well, and and that dog does not hunt no. for very long. And uh, you know another very interesting statistic, or or what I heard on the Joe Rogan podcast is uh, uh, one of my favorites, a guy named Brett Weinstein. And he's not a, a macro guy, but he's, uh, I believe, an evolutionary biologist. And his, his brother's a, a genius as well, Eric Weinstein. But um, I really enjoy listening to them both. And Me too. on uh, this episode of Rogan's podcast, they were talking about wealth inequality. And Brett pointed out that um, 
throughout history, it's, it isn't necessarily the um, how well or how badly the people at the bottom are doing. That's not what, what gives you social unrest, typically. The, the, what gives you the social unrest is the delta between who's at the bottom and who's at the top. So yeah. as an example, in a society where the bottom, let's say, was making $15,000 a year, but the top was making 100000 you wouldn't have near as much social unrest as a society where the bottom is making 30000 but the top is making $3 million. Yeah, it's a relative thing. It's always relativity, isn't it? It's the extremity. Yeah. Because it almost creates parallel universe syndromes um, of existence. It, it's, it is a parallel universe here. Mm. It absolutely is. Like nothing I've ever seen. And, and most people can't appreciate that who live in the United States because it's just like looking at yourself in the mirror every day. Yeah. You know, you just can't see those subtle changes. But for someone like me who, who leaves the United States for years on end, and comes back, it's just like, it's like looking at yourself in the mirror five years later. You're like, yeah. whoa, what on earth happened? Yeah. And it's the same thing coming back to the US. You can see these dramatic changes. They're just startling yeah. that, that I just don't think most Americans see. There's a great channel that I was watching. I think it was, uh, I think it's called The Black Pigeon. And by the way, all those people you mentioned, I w I've been to Scottsdale, it was lovely. We were working with Infusionsoft, which is in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and we had an amazing night out with one of our members of our community. It's a beautiful area. And there were great car dealerships all around. I'm also a car nut like you. Um, and I can tell you in London, when I was last, last there, you can go to central London, which is exceedingly wealthy. Uh, and every ATM has a glue sniffing drug addict under a blanket or a sleeping bag. Uh, and then right. there's a certain part where the, in laybys, they're lying on top of each other in rows. And there's actually, uh, the, he was highlighting the differences in um, etiquette and quality of culture of the Japanese and how the West has kind of lost their, their uh, he was part blaming it on excessive immigration. I don't want to go down there, but... He was saying there was a, an, in Japan, which is pretty homogeneous, they actually have these toilets with a smoke glass when you enter in it. Uh, and everything is kept immaculately clean. And he was saying, he has this public toilet because he's a UK uh, YouTuber. And he was saying, it's just impossible to use because there's all the drug addicts uh, and all of that. And it says, we've lost our sense of uh, culture. And it had a lot to do also with just this complete polarization of society because there was just uh, drug addicts, um, loss of common esprit de corps and culture and this polarization of wealth. And it was in the wealthiest areas that this was happening. And he was saying, he was just asking the question, how can you have such uh, high levels of mutual respect in one society and not in another? Um, but it was also highlighting the polarization of wealth and the amount of people that have been left behind. And it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. And as you say, it's the seeds of revolution. But the, my concern in terms right. of that is that it's not actually these drug addicts on the street. They become the useful idiots. And that the real revolutionaries are probably the, the people that orchestrated the situation in the same sense. Because it's also noticeable that it seems through academia that's been very well p published, we are going to this Bolshevik uh, sympathizer type socialist uh, solution. And it almost seems it's the West's time to get flattened. Um, you know, the Russian culture is deeply scarred. They keep to themselves. They don't show too much emotion, etc. I call this the sort of almost like MK Ultra trauma to an entire society coming out of uh, Bolshevism and the amount of deaths and how people spied on each other and the Stasi and all of that sort of thing. There's this Eastern European and Russian uh, sort of suppression. Um, my partner is from that area and she loves America just because people say, hey, how are you doing? And smile and say that. And you feel engaged against as a person and how that was dangerous it, it, culturally it, to do in uh, behind the curtain. I worry now for this this uh, movement that is swinging towards to come and flatten the West. And could we face uh, in a and I'm, I'm hardly bringing the joy and the Christmas spirit by asking this question, but could we face this? Uh, rat out your mate culture, this over authoritarian government, uh, who do you think owns gold? I, I have concerns that we're going down that uh, road. 
you're, you're already seeing that happen in the yeah. United States, that rat out call. I mean, look at California there. The, the, I'm not sure it was the government or the governor, whatever uh, political figure comes out and is, is advising you to basically rat out your neighbor if they're having more than you know two or three cars in their driveway or you see them walking by uh, without wearing a mask or something. You, you're already seeing that, I think, everywhere in the United States at alarming levels. So th that's part of the present. I, I don't think that's part of the future. Well, it's part of the future, but I think it's already here right now. And you know, going back to the central planners and what you're saying about Klaus and the Great Reset, one thing that I think is really good about that is, is more and more people in that are maybe closer to the mainstream than I am are talking about it and their yeah. guests are talking about it. I was, I'm thinking about uh, the Tom Woods podcast and I'm a big yeah. fan of Tom Woods, but you know, he's, he doesn't get too much into the, the economic stuff. It's more on the libertarian side, but he had a guy on there that was an expert on uh, the coronavirus and whatnot. And, uh, and this guy starts talking about Klaus and the World Economic Forum and how yeah. so many people that are part of the World Economic Forum are uh, heads of pharmaceutical corporations. And that you've got to start connecting these dots. And I had never even really thought about that angle, but I'm like, okay, this is great that, that people are, are actually starting to think this through. And the, the tinfoil hatters are becoming less and less and mainstream less foil yeah. <laughs> yeah. well yeah, I, I mean i've been one of them from the get-go I, I felt all of this was coming a long time but part of that is also a worry because essentially what we're saying is more people have spotted the wolf um but it's a case that at some point the wolf had to break cover to to escalate this if we see a large amount of this COVID response being also very control orientated, very dictatorial, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, is, it not a, is it not a concern now that they have uh, effectively believed that they've got the game so much under control that they can make their move at this point and they can bring about all these changes and that just because we're all waking up, it's not going to be likes on my YouTube and shares on my Facebook that is going to stop them. And in a sense, the Internet has become our primal scream room for crying about our fears. But if that's how you're revolt, re re revolting, they don't care. They're just giving you a tag as being divergent for later when they're choosing who goes to the gulag. Um, but it doesn't stop the steamroller that seems to be working Slowly, but very certainly, and it seems to almost have caught a bit of a downhill. And now every time I look, it's halfway down the street, coming a lot closer to my front door. Um, and I mean, this is outside maybe economics, but economics is a social science as well. It's politics, mm. it's power, it's money, mm. it's everything. So I think we're in our scope to discuss it. What should the guys do watching this right now as we're saying, man, this stuff's getting out of hand. How do we slow the machine? And I'm not saying grab a pitchfork and go and stab a politician in the neck. I don't think that serves you. But uh, how, do you, how do we push back and how do you personally I, prep? Yeah, I think there's two sides of the coin. And that I, I am alarmed at, the, at how rapidly the IMF and the World Economic Forum are openly discussing things like central bank digital currencies and a digital SDR and where they want to be in 2030, where you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. But uh, on the other hand, I think it's good from the standpoint that sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. Yeah. So uh, if you've got bad ideas, we want them to be out in the sunlight. We don't want them hiding out in, in the shadows because once they're exposed to that sunlight, people can intuitively see what's going on here. They don't have to be a, a, a conspiracy theorist or, you know, Alex Jones or anything like that. And just a good example of this is if you go to the World Economic Forum's videos on YouTube, yep. just type in like Great Reset and look at the amount of uh, the percentage of down votes to up votes or, or a thumbs up to thumbs down. And they'll have like, like, two or three thumbs up and like 3,000 <laughs> like, <clears throat> thumbs 
<laughs> but but let's be frank, they didn't sit and plan this in the dark rooms for all these many years. And I think this has been many years in planning um, and expect to break it in cover with us all knowing our freedoms are going to be reduced only to be put off because there's a couple of down votes on their uh, material. We need. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be put off by it, but no. I think that it's good that it's out in the sunlight. So the normies, you know, not just people like you and I, yeah. but just everyday people see this and share it with their friends. Like, this is insanity. Like, look at this Klaus guy. In fact, I um, had a bunch of people over the other night for that Mike Tyson fight. Oh, yes, yes. Very and good. I, yeah, so I had a bunch of people and a few of those individuals that I, I hadn't, I don't really know that well. They came up to me and they're like, man, we've been watching your videos. We saw that video on Klaus. That guy is crazy. What's going on with that? And they're, the whole entire that night, they're wanting to talk to me about how insane Klaus is from watching my videos. And these are our mainstream, like nine to five, you know, yeah. corporate gig. They're, they're not like, uh, yeah. you know, fringe type of individuals. So that that's, I think that's great news. And, but, but again, I, I totally understand that it is alarming that they're spreading that message even more. And they're having the, the, the wavos to, to get out there and do it. You know, another thing I'd point out that most people don't realize if you have any, if you have any inclination that uh, the 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 global elite don't play a big role with the people pulling the string strings at social media, um, you need to rethink that uh, very quickly. And I'll give you an example. So, like two weeks ago, uh, Klaus of, of all people joined Twitter. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you, you knew no, that. I know he had a he bunch does. of fake is he, is he wearing these dark Lord of the Sith outfits again? <laughs> no, that, that was like a fake, like a fake Klaus account. <laughs> but he actually it's an official, you know, Klaus Schwab uh, account. Yeah. And I have been having this problem with people setting up fake George Gammon accounts too, yeah. and trying to scam people. I mean, it's getting just outrageous Bots, the amount yeah. of people almost weekly that set up fake george gammon instagram accounts twitter accounts and youtube constantly yeah. and trying to scam people with with you know crypto this and crypto that so my point is i'm always having my uh assistant email twitter and email youtube and all these other to, to get me verified with those blue check marks yeah so we'll know that it's me so they're not getting scammed out of ten or twenty thousand dollars which I, I, you know, I feel horrible about and I feel partly responsible for. So we're, we're really proactive yeah, about trying us to do that. And, and my assistant, every single time she goes to Twitter, she gets the exact same pleasant email in, in return and she forwards it to me that they say, unfortunately, right now, they're not doing any blue check mark verifications and they won't start uh, accepting applications until sometime mid 2021 yeah okay now let's go back to two weeks ago klaus just straight away pops on <laughs> the very first time sets up an account the yeah. very first day the, the very first hour who knows he gets a blue check mark from twitter away. verifying his account while twitter is telling me that they're not doing that anymore they're not going to do it till 2021 so at the very least you know that these global elites have a lot more pull, let's say, oh, than definitely. you and I do. And, and I'm, I'm someone that, you know, I don't have a, a large following, but on Twitter, I've got maybe 45,000 yeah. uh, followers. So it's not like I, I've just got 10 or 20 or something. Yeah. You know, I've got a significant amount of people who follow me there. So it, and it goes back to Orwell, you know, an animal farm. It's all animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. Oh, and that's at the very least. And if you really want to put the tinfoil hat on, you can, you need to start asking yourself, okay, well, who really operates these social media platforms? And yeah. I'm not saying that it's Klaus. Uh, I would probably lean on the side of, 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 of saying that, he, he's got a lot of clout and those people at Twitter know that, hey, yes, he doesn't run the show here, but it's in our best interest to go ahead and give this guy a blue check mark if he wants one and ignore everyone else.
I'd just add a narrative uh, to that. I don't know if you recall, you mentioned Alex Jones. I'll just bring it up. He was simultaneously uh, deplatformed by a smorgasbord of social media, which remember right. they're supposed to be independent, separate businesses. And just prior to that, they'd all been called in um, to see uh, the Atlantic Committee, which is run by no less than Henry Kissinger um, and has the Atlantic magazine, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, they were all given, brought in and chatted to and then simultaneously made this sweeping. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, if, one, if you and I are rivals and you're selling cars and I'm selling cars, I don't say we don't serve these people at the same day that you do. Um, we're independent. They made their decision for whatever reason. We're a different business. Uh, so it was very ironic that it was almost universally agreed and Apple removed, them from, uh, removed him from I, iTunes or, or whatever the equivalent is, iStore now. Um, so it was, yeah, it was certainly orchestrated, which means there's a, there's a hidden layer above because these CEOs might talk to each other out of professional interest if they're over at the Bilderberg meeting, but they're supposed to be competing um, and they're supposed to have different views uh, of how to serve people. And when you get a uniform blanket action, it points to uh, heads being smashed together, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that takes me back to my days as an entrepreneur. And sometimes you just have to make hard decisions where there or you both options are 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 bad. Yeah. And so if I'm going to give those CEOs the the benefit of the doubt, let's just do that for a moment. I'm not yeah. saying this is accurate. Let's just give as much of the benefit of the doubt as we possibly can. Um, I, I've been not not in a position like this, but as an uh, owner of a business and as an entrepreneur, I, I've been in a position where you're like, OK, this is these I've got two options and they're both bad. Yeah. So you've got to take the, the least bad option. And a lot of times it has to do with, um, you know, your employees. That's one thing that that's tough, really tough about Silicon Valley in San Francisco is they're so desperate for good employees and engineers that a lot of times that that comes into play. You know, I was listening to I think it was uh, I think it was Sam Harris yeah. on on the Rogan podcast, and they were talking about this insanity and how pervasive it is in Silicon Valley. And and Sam uh, was telling a story about how he had just had dinner uh, with uh, several of these. Uh, social media executives that he said, you know, you definitely know their names. And one of them who he was sitting next to was, was talking about how it's just everyone there has just completely gone off the deep end. And so this is what they're saying behind the closed doors. Right. Yeah. And, and he gave example of an employee that were now in their main offices, let's call it, I don't know, let's call it Google. Right. Sam didn't name any names, but let's just call it Google. Yeah. They're having to put they're having to put cat litter boxes in all of their bathrooms for the employees that that think they're a cat or identify as a a, a cat. No. No. <laughs> and come the on. guy is like, you know, almost like breaking down, like like you know, pulling his hair out, but he's saying, Sam, I don't have a choice. No like, way. I, I, I can't believe I that. Have so maybe there's a component there too. Wow. It's the end of times. Um, George, it's great having you on. I wanted to ask you before we let you go. I've got one question from a big fan, by the way, um, who follows your channel, is a member of our community as well. We've got a great overlap, by the way, uh, and we're always happy and sharing your YouTubes. Uh, he says, uh, I asked him because he's one of our insiders, been with me for a while. Uh, if you had a question for George, what would you ask? I, I kind of gave him my answer and I thought, I, I even thought, no, you I don't know if your question's right, but I want to respect him and say, ask it. He thinks sure. uh, and he says, um, what if there was no major reset? What if they ch could it be the situation be saved? In other words, I, I said to him, there's too much debt. He said, but maybe, maybe, maybe if they make the right decisions. I said, they're swinging communist. He says, could the situation be saved? Am I just a pessimist? Are you just a pessimist? Or are we getting a 
blow-off event, a major smackdown, and then being introduced to what's been planned, a new system. Is there any way we don't go through this hard rebirthing and that way we could return to logical, sensible money, the debt could be kind of whittled away, deflated away, and that we actually have a soft landing which doesn't involve rev a financial Bretton Woods Mark II moment and a full-blown revolution. Um, give us your take. What would have to happen for that even to potentially occur? I think it's possible, but it's a matter of probabilities. Yeah. And so what you're talking about is kind of like a Ray Dalio, beautiful deleveraging. Yeah. And if we could just somehow magically create this, let's call it uh, 5% inflation while we peg the yield curve, keep interest rates low and just gradually over time kind of inflate away the debt with as little pain as possible. Yeah. Um, that, that's, again, it, it's possible, but I, I think the probabilities would be incredibly, incredibly low. Now, we talked about the Great Reset and these global elite coming in. I think that there's um, a good chance that uh, the majority of people just don't go for that. And I think what's even uh, brighter is the fact that a lot of the countries will not go along with the Great Reset because it's not in their best interest at all, such as the Middle East, such as places like Brazil and Russia, for that matter. You know, they, they, there's a very low probability that they'll go along with this nonsense. So there's yeah. going to be kind of uh, areas of, of, of hope out there. But I think my base case would be we're going to just gradually grind lower from an economic standpoint. And there's yeah. people that say, well, it's deflation, it's inflation. I I'm not sure which it's going to be, but you're gonna have negative real GDP growth. And I, in a recent video, I used a chart of Japan going back to the, uh, actually the 1970s. And you just see this, this even, you know, we know what, know what happened in 1990, but it was kind of on a downtrend before then anyway even with this this big spike we had in in the uh, late 1980s and since then it's just gone down and down and yeah. down and down and you look at rome as another example it's the same type of thing you just had this gradual grind just lower and lower and lower where the wealth of the society was destroyed and i think it's very it's a lot easier for people to see when they look at the wealth of a society, not in terms of how many currency units it has, but its ability to produce more goods and services ever or at increasing rates of efficiency. And once that starts going in the opposite direction, which is yeah. where I think we're headed now, it's just this, this, this standard of living or the wealth of society just decreases. And I think it just keeps going down and down and down and down until change is thrust upon us. I don't think we'll get to a point where we consciously change and say, okay, we're going in the wrong, in the wrong direction. We need a new monetary system. Yeah. This Euro dollar system isn't working out anymore. And this fiat just doesn't pan out. We need to make a, a complete 180. We know we're going to have to bite the bullet. We know there's going to be some economic pain, but it's going to be better in the long run. That's possible, but I, I think it's highly, highly unprobable. Uh, uh, it's very, very low. I hope we can get there, but I, I highly doubt it. And again, it goes back to another video I did where you look at how entrenched the interests are of the government of the people for that matter, because, you know, everyone now, oh, who wants to get rich going out there and working 80 hours a week and uh, committing your life savings and waking up at four o'clock in the morning and sacrificing everything when I could just buy Bitcoin yeah. or I could just buy gold or I could buy, you know, I could just buy something and the asset goes up in price. And then you have the Cantillon effect with all these people at the World Eco Economic Forum where the more they can destroy economic output, the more money the central banks and governments will print. And of course, they're closest to that money printing. Yeah. Therefore, they get richer and richer and richer. So you have all of these entrenched interests. And that's why I think, again, the probability of us making a, de a decision to change is very, very low. 
And it has to be universal where it seems like we're almost synchronized in the opposite direction, as you've already mentioned, the MMT. I mean, one of my cues was going to be, is MMT now already for official policy? And in your opening statement, I think you almost answered that. Uh, and the problem is we have it, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in Australia or if you're in America or in Europe it seems to be across the board. So we almost have a synchronized group of people that all decided we've all got to be lepers in the leper colony. Um, and unfortunately, that's not conducive to a healthy system. So I, I, I tend to agree it requires, it, it's nothing is impossible, but it would take a very strong leadership that would have to transcend nation states to synchronize in doing exactly the opposite of what they've been setting up to do. Um, and I think they've been setting up to do what they're doing for a reason. And I don't think that reason, these are long-term planners. I don't think that reason changes until they've got the outcome they want. Um, right. But yeah, thanks. Uh, it, as you always say, and, and you made a very interesting point, don't get into a belief system. Don't suffer from 100% conviction. Um, no matter how uh, I feel the strength of this economic bias, we can and will be wrong. Um, and those are really powerful uh, principles. And certainly yeah, don't be place... Very be very careful that you're not putting yourself into a social media echo chamber. That's exactly it. Because, I mean, it, they are self-selecting as well. All of these media chains. If you just look at your Facebook and all that, I've got people, you know, because of certain views I've expressed that have similar views that keep being put on my uh, list of new friends and that are sending me requests. And I don't get categories outside uh, of that. So it's very easy, as you say, to get echo chamber. You, you need to bump into those other people that think the exact opposite uh, of, yep. of what you do. Just for that reality check that they are out there. I'm also going to just check some of the comments here. Guys, why don't you post some comments? Uh, we've got a live stream going out as well right now, George. In fact, uh, you're very popular and the number's uh, 629 already coming on. Lots of likes, oh, lots cool. of shares. Um, I've got George Gammon here in the room. While I ask George, what's your best uh, in what's your fastest horse and your second and third horse in that portfolio that you're having? Um, what's your favorite trade or investment? Uh, uh, you guys post a question in the comments and let's see um, what you'd like me to ask George while we uh, got him on the stream. I like coal <laughs> because everyone hates it. <laughs> And uh, I, I like that it's just because um, I'm very contrarian in my views. I, I, I'd like, I like copper at, in March. I, I don't, I mean, I loved it in March. Mm. Uh, not, so it's got, you know, the price has run quite a bit lately. So maybe waiting for a pullback there. But also I, I like the gold miners uh, around this area. You know, they've got beaten up a little bit. I'm not sure what the price did this last week. I wasn't paying much attention. But uh, I, I like them because I think that uh, there's a, a great argument with all of the, the money printing that we'll most likely have in the future when they change the Federal Reserve Act or continue to ignore it. And that's going to give a lot of tailwind to Bitcoin, a lot of tailwind to gold. It's just I like gold a little bit better right now because there's less emotional investing from what I see yeah. around the miners. And uh, everyone thinks they're kind of gone for dead. And I always like those investments better than the ones everyone's excited about. I, I, yeah, I like, I like your call there. In fact, I started to look strongly at gold again when everyone started talking about Bitcoin's destroyed gold. Um, yeah, I, I, exactly. I'm like you. I get a bit nervous when the, my echo chamber is too one-sided and too many people are sitting on the same side of the boat. I straight away went and uh, we'll cover that one. Let me just show you copper because you haven't had a chance to see it in a bit. Um, uh, yep, just hold on a second. Getting the copper chart up. This is one of them. That's on the monthly. Uh, George uh, very nicely liked it in March and you were around 339 uh, there and it's virtually doubled, uh, George. Uh, so that was a great shout by you on the copper side. I actually had uh, gone a bit... I actually made more money on coal. I made more money on coal back in March. Wow. I bought coal at, uh, I bought the coal ETF KOL when it was under, uh, well, they did a, a reverse stock split, but it basically, oh, what did it do? It, uh, I think it more than doubled in price. Uh, then they dissolved the ETF. So now you're getting your money back. So now I've got to kind of create my own ETF 
with uh, what's left. I'm kind of in the process of doing that with Chris McIntosh. But, you know, that's kind of had a run, too. Um, but there's still, you know, relatively speaking, you know, uranium would fall into that category as well. It's had quite a run since I bought a lot of it in March. But still, historically speaking, it's 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 super, super cheap. Of the energy plays that you've mentioned, that's the one I uh, personally like the most because I think uh, coal is going to be a hard sell. It's the dirtiest of the lot, um, but there's plenty yeah, but of it. Yeah, allergic. So the, the use of steel, that's really the, I think the demand bull argument would be if, if the governments come in with green new deals, it's going to require a ton of steel and they're not going to be able to make that steel without coal. And then you look at the supply side destruction and that pretty much everyone who uh, has sold or would sell has already sold because of all these funds getting it out, uh, you know, not wanting to touch it with a 10 foot pole because of environmental reasons. So that's uh, kind of looking at it maybe from a different angle. Yes, it's so unloved that it's got only upside. Yeah, and, and tobacco and too. Tobacco, the last time I looked at it, was was pretty darn cheap. And most people don't realize the best performing stock in the entire stock market since 1968 has been Altria, the cigarette maker. Wow. That, I didn't know that. I know they were making money hand over fist, but I didn't, I wasn't aware. Yeah, and, it's uh, been, and it's been the most, uh, the best performing asset class or the best performing stocks since the mid 1990s wow wow that is about that being back. what do you make of tesla george i mean f fundamentally and then technically because i think i have two separate views there's something going on there there's a freight train obviously the sp500 inclusion has been the recent fire but What's it? A million um, million dollars market cap must be getting close to a million and a quarter or a million and a half per car. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's 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 fun to watch. I, I wouldn't touch it with a ten foot pole on <laughs> on either side. Um, it's just not the way I invest. I, I I don't like I don't like buying a dollar for three dollars and hoping it goes to five dollars. No. You know, so many people, in, even in my investment community, they'll say, you know, they'll talk about this new technology or this new uh, X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. And, and you're basically angel investing. There, there's no yeah. profits there that you're just kind of speculating on the future. I don't really like doing that too much. I like buying a dollar for 50 cents. Yeah. And it's a completely different strategy. And so I like businesses that are making a ton of money that have a lot of cash flow, but that cash flow is discounted for whatever reason. And you're not really speculating on whether or not this business will ever, ever make money and that all the stars kind of have to align. And I think that uh, although Tesla, the, the downside, I'm not talking about the price. I'm talking about the company actually going out of business. Yeah, uh, That downside is, is a lot lower now because they would have so much access to just limitless capital unless we get a bear market. And that's something that, that most, and, you know, the Fed, let's say they can't come in and prop it up. Let's say they go back to, let's say we go into Japan mode from 1990 all the way to today where in nominal terms, the stock market is lower. Uh, Europe. Exact same thing. You know, Gunlock points this out all the time. So it, it's it's not that the United States stock market is somehow unique in the sense that it can never go down. We could be in, we could come into a bear market and in 20 years, we could be lower nominally than we are today. So you'd have to think through kind of what that means. And if interest rates do go back up, to where these pension funds can meet their obligations of 7% returns with, by buying 10-year treasuries instead of having to take that money and speculate in a VC fund that buys WeWork and, and Tesla and Uber and DoorDash, then they're going to do that. So you'd have all of those flows come out of at least these new IPOs. And you kind of have to scratch your head and say, okay, well, where do all these other companies that just burn incinerate cash but yet have a hundred billion dollar market cap you know where do they end up in an environment where the 10-year is trading at call it five or six percent i don't know if they 
if they still exist because that uh, that super cheap money or this this uh, environment where money is just being thrown on any company that has a, a story that's gone yeah. and um, that might be the reality check for a lot of these uh, quote unquote tech companies like uh, Tesla and DoorDash, or maybe not, you know, maybe it just keeps going in the same direction and money just becomes looser and looser. And uh, I don't know, but it, I'm not, it's the same thing as bonds. You know, I wouldn't buy bonds on the long end right now, just because I, I don't like to buy things when they're at 5,000 year highs. And I like to buy things when they're cheap and there's nothing cheap right now about bonds. And there's definitely nothing cheap right now about Tesla. No, I, I often wonder, because if we go work backwards with the end in mind, let's take our scenario casting efforts that says Klaus knows something we don't or is orchestrating something through a network of dark forces. Um, how do you get everybody out of their assets? Well, one of the best ways, particularly when I think of it, it's property is one of the most fundamental things, turning everyone into a rental class. How do you get people out of their property? Well, um, you create a boom, you create everyone, you get everybody leveraged, and then you put interest rates up. Um, I, I remember being around or hearing the stories when they were defending the pound when uh, the Soros event occurred. And you had folks uh, in the dealing room floors saying, who wants a house? Because the guy's interest rates had just gone from effective paying because they were all on floating rates. They weren't on fixed rates. And now that disease has kind of, I don't know how much it's caught on in the States now. I mean, if I was buying property I would, and you had the option of a 30-year fixed, I'd take it, even if it was more expensive, um, just for eliminating the tail risk uh, and because it will be a low fixed. Um, but what about the spy? I like your notion and your idea of, of interest rate risk, because I think that's a great way of getting the banks to own everybody's property. Um, and also for clearing out, I mean, there's a lot of commercial property with nowhere to go. No one's going to offices anymore. Everyone's working from home. You want to repurpose that into your high density urbanized sleeping capsules for the, ple the peasants. Um, you've got to pick all that land and that property up. You want to pick it up cheap, spike the rates, put the final, um, you know, stake through Dracula's heart. Uh, government, aka the banks, uh, and the government uh, by decree or dark government, whatever you want to call it, actually ends up um, taking all those assets and saying, you're forgiven on your debt. That's the big deal. But now you, you know, we're doing this and you have to do the following, go get your vaccine, do etc. So I like the argument that that interest rate policy, because what a Fed could spring a trap on us. They also MMT, they lure us all into the sensitivity Oh, okay, money for everyone, UBI for everyone. Then we start to get into the inflationary. They can quite justifiably say, well, we're acting in the best interests. We can't have a parabola where the dollar does the Zimbabwe dollar. Um, we have to put a stop under it. Real rates are, we need positive real interest rates again. They could spike it up. Uh, in the UK, it spiked in the pound crisis when the government was wasting pounds on defending an overly high peg that. Uh, Thatcher negotiated to the euro, um, they wasted the citizens' money by attempting to defend it. And in the end, they had to put the interest rates up anyway. And so you actually had in the series of a couple of days, interest rates going from normalized levels of around four or five, I, don't quote me on the exact numbers, four or five percent getting into the mid, near mid-teens in, 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 in yep. days and weeks. Not, not talking about a, you know, a slowly tightening cycle. I'm talking about events. And it's like every day the central bank has given you an update and every third day they're actually up in it by another couple of points. Uh, imagine how does that scenario play out in the US and would it see many, many people dehomed and becoming tenants in their ex-owned property potentially? Yeah, and I think a wealth tax would also play into that. But most people forget mortgages as an example. It's a market rate. Uh, you know, people just in our echo chamber, let's say, a lot of them say, oh, well, you never have to worry about rates going up because the Fed's just going to peg the yield curve. And, um, you know, they'll let inflation run hot. The savers will be, get screwed, but uh, they'll just peg rates at whatever it is, Frankenstein, the yield curve. Yeah. 
and they, they won't let it go up past a certain point. Okay, well, that may be fine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that mortgage rates obey because the, the, the market rate is going to add a risk premium. Correct. So <laughs> if, if the market sees that they're going to be paid back with uh, devalued dollars, regardless of, of where the Fed is, is pegging the yield curve for treasuries, uh, they don't care. You know, the, 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 okay, the 10 years at 1.5%, great. You still got mortgage rates at, at 10% yeah. because of, of the risk premium associated with future inflation. That said, I think there's a strong argument for the, the, the combining of the balance sheets, like we were talking about before, where the, the treasury now has the ability to create bank reserves, which are now seen as legal tender, yeah. and they can do whatever they want. And so it, I think they go in there and buy mortgage-backed securities. They, they buy the debt. I think they would definitely buy, we've already seen them buy junk debt for corporations. Yes. And everyone, the consumer, the, 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 corp, uh, the corporations are just levered to the hilt. So if we get into a situation where the market rates are adjusting up, to your point, then the Fed could, or the Treasury, could come in and just buy all of that debt to keep them low. But remember, as that debt goes on the balance sheet of the government or the Fed, in essence, they're they're owning more and more of the houses. They're owning more and more of the businesses to where if they went into default for whatever reason, then they would go to the the, the debt holders, which in this case would be the government. Yeah. And then I think you back to that stat we were talking about with 52% of young adults living at home with their parents. Yeah. And I, I don't know if Klaus comes in and all in one foul swoop just owns everything or the government takes everything, but it's just kind of this gradual process where they jack the wealth tax, let's say up to 90%. And therefore when um, you know the person passes away their house, they might not have any leverage on it at all. Yeah. But the family has to sell the house because they have to pay the, the wealth tax. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And maybe there's some way that the government just takes the house instead. If, if you can't sell it or they pay you 100 cents on the dollar, if in nominal prices, the housing has gone down. Uh, I think it's very interesting what you're talking about with the malls. You know, these malls are, are going to be ghost towns yeah. in uh, the, the, the very near future. And we could see something where housing is totally unaffordable because the regulations are so hot are so high that the builders can't produce new housing stock entry-level homes starter homes at a profit yeah so there's just no more supply coming onto the market and that this becomes a real social problem and you know the government buys the mall and demos everything and puts up government housing and so you have a, a generation of people that kind of gets accustomed to having government housing. They like it for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, why would you own a normal house? It's cumbersome. You have property taxes. You have to maintain it. I can just live in my government cube and, uh, That's right. you know, I can rent everything. I don't have to own a car and, and I'm happy, like yeah. Klaus says. The future so, high again, density. The future high density Soviet block era homes that you're used to in all those grim movies. We could be about to create that new living class in these repurposed areas of commercial property being flushed out and all, uh, all of that. I could see that. And they'll be horrible, totally. cheap, tight. <laughs> and in years to come, they'll be like the council flats in East London, uh, Manchester in the UK and the Soviet era block um boxes as you call them yeah and then to think about what that world looks like you also have to think about that social volatility we were talking about earlier in the sense that i think every pretty much every state now marijuana is legal well, maybe not every state but within the next two or three years every state's going to legalize uh marijuana which, which i think is good 
at, from a libertarian standpoint, but it does have unintended consequences. In Oregon, I don't know if you followed this news, they made every drug legal. So not just marijuana, we're talking about cocaine, heroin, uh, crystal meth, <laughs> shrewd, exactly. like, I don't know, all the drugs, but they, they made them all legal. Now, okay, I, I, from a libertarian standpoint, I, I get it, but you can't do that and defund the police no. at the same time. It's not a good like, combination. That, like that is no bueno, <laughs> especially when you're in a city that is in terminal decline as is when you look at the rate of homelessness yeah. in Portland. I mean, it's terrible, yeah. terrible. I, I mean, it. it's, yeah. it, it, it's a big tent city, basically. Yeah. And so you have all of these homeless individuals. You make drugs totally legal. You defund the police. And then you have <laughs> the government owning all housing. How does that play out, right? Like, like how, at the end of the day, human beings need hope. Absolutely. They need hope. And if they don't have hope, then you get very, very bad results. And uh, you know, you look at the welfare state in the in the U.S. as an example, and you look at the like divorce statistics, and I mean, just go down the the a laundry list of stats that have just become horrible since they implemented this welfare state. And don't take my word on it; you got to look at the uh, the work and the research of my favorite economist, Thomas Sowell. Who has yeah. studied this extensively but when uh, when a human being becomes dependent uh, an adult becomes dependent upon a, a, the state instead of themselves that, that can i come in on this out. one i i sat with uh, uh, i did a very interesting program that was part of getting becoming a printed author and uh, I made a female friend who was on the program who wrote a book distinctively on the damage that welfare statism actually does. And she came from North England, which has got a lot of welfare, the ex-shipyards and mines, etc. And the minute you take away the need and therefore um, the requirement for someone to seek self-actualization by giving them mm. that safety net, not only do they become reliant, but they become unhappier. And they become right. unhappier because you've taken away their right or reason to exist and to grow. And actually, not only do they take it from you, but they hate you for it. Because deep down, there's an inner knowing and there's an inner understanding that I've, I've taken away all the experiences of you learning to hunt. I've taken away all the experiences of you learning to do, deliver value. I've taken away your growth. I've taken away your uh, future, e largely experiences and growth. Because mm. by learning to deliver value, you get actualized. It's that passing of energy. Money is actually comes down to flow of energy, really. Can you do something of high value that people are prepared to release some of their energy to you? And what do you do with that energy? Do you manage it responsibly? And one of my favorite speakers says it always flows from those who value it most away from those that value it least. So if you then right. give, create a dividend stream just for existing and being born, you immediately make that person someone who values it least because he knows the further will be there and he can exist and his house is paid for, he's in a council house, he's in this. And you actually put them in a low social strata, even if they could have subsequently self-actualized so it's an incredibly destructive force i i yeah. won't say there should be a policy of a hundred percent no welfare you could be exceedingly unlucky you could trip up and be paralyzed and all your skills could have been physical um you could be you know maimed there needs to be some degree of uh community support for exceptional cases but anybody who's able-bodied uh, should be made. And there's famous sayings that said a man's toil is his happiness, you know, the, that by having a reason to get up in the morning um, and responsibilities to make. Uh, so I absolutely get that. And what I fear is we are going to break the character of Western man with the, mm. the economic direction that we're going in, not just in the masculine sense, I mean, for women as well, but I think particularly in the masculine sense. I mean, in the participation stats on labor, many people don't know, but the male participation stats in labor 
are lower than the depression lows because obviously you'll know that from the 30s through the 60s we obviously got lots more female participation but as a percentage by gender actually we're destroying male kind uh, very yeah. much and lurching down this and I, I wonder, I always say, I, the reason I never got into dealing drugs is uh, the CIA hates the competition and they've got nasty, uh, nasty habits and nasty people uh, to interact uh, with competition. But that joke aside, is I wouldn't surprise me state uh, and political actors are very strong in this releasing this new wave and saying, well, here's a freedom and an almost libertarian thing we're giving you. But I would be sure they're behind the profiting in it. Uh, and then, as you say, combining that with defunding police, it must be a formula for uh, wanting a slum. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and also, too, on what you were just on that uh, topic you were just discussing, I, I think, and it's, it's a very uh, touchy subject, of course, but I think from, if you look at society and you want to look at economics, you have to take into consideration the fact that you know, the 50% divorce rate, that let's call it 50% of young males, you yeah. know, kids are being raised by a single mom. Yeah. And I'm not here to say that single moms are bad. I'm not, you know, I no, think no, obviously absolutely. they deserve a lot of respect, but the <clears> simple <throat> fact of the matter is that's, uh, when, when you're, I mean, you know, it's when you're a 10 year old boy, eight year old boy, uh, 11 year old boy, it's, it's very beneficial to have a strong male figure to Absolutely. look up to. And if you don't, most often those, you know, 10 year old boys with just their moms in the picture, a group of them are, are going to, you know, they're going to find, um, mischievous, uh, uh, to get in, you know, they're going to find mischief to get into they're going to go down a, the wrong path. And um, then you take it a step further and you say, okay, well, they're in school. Okay, fine. But 90% of the teachers in school are female. Yeah. You see, so you have this generation of males who really have no uh, male influence, positive, strong, resilient male influence in their life. And as those males get into their 20s and 30s, yeah. They just, and again, I, I don't want to, um, you know, poke fun at anyone. That's not what this is about. It's just the bottom line is, is there, you're not going to have the same economic output with that group of males than you would have with a group of males that uh, was brought up with that, that father figure there that they could learn from and they could learn how to be resilient and they could learn the value of, of, getting outside of your comfort zone. You know, I think back to my childhood and that was the big difference between the, 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 you know, my mom and my aunt and my grandmother compared to my uncle, my father and my, my grandfather in the sense that, you know, the women would, would really, uh, they're always, you know, very loving and very warm and very nurturing where the, you know, the guys would be like, okay, you're going to learn to ski, buddy. I'm going to take you to the top of the, the triple black diamond and um, we'll see you at the bottom. Bye. <laughs> and you just have to stand for, for yourself. And that's just the way guys operate. And um, I mean, again, for females, they might think that's horrible and it's mean and it's cruel, but I'm sure your father and, and the male figures in your life were the exact same way Absolutely. when you were growing up. And I think there's something to be said for that. A bit of sink and swim. George, this has been immense fun. Um, by the way, the comments lit up with that. Many of the guys saying there's a bit of a war on the family um, and states trying to agree. inject Your itself. Family, that's right. Yeah, trying to inject itself as the substitute. We're all going to live in virtual worlds as single individuals interacting with states. And they, these are all worrying yep. trends. Um, but nonetheless, uh, thank you for your great intellect. Thank you for your amazing channel, by the way. We all supporters, and as I say and I repeat, please go around to George's uh, channel and sub him. He's also got 45,000 followers. Let's see if we can make that 50. Uh, he is on at George Gammon uh, with a double M in the surname. 
uh, go and grab him there and interact uh, with good grace there. Uh, thank you so much for coming on a second time. I want to wish you a Merry uh, Christmas in spite of all these great challenges. The wolf has shown itself. Here's a virtual sip with yeah. you in champagne. And we'll see you in 21 um, onwards and upwards with wealth building. And thank you for all you've done. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All the best. Bye-bye.